We kind of debated whether or not to uh, have that song. It's such a strong statement, I think. Some, you know, when you think about freedom and yet you look at the reality around us, it's that contrasting image of, of freedom and yet sort of the uncomfortable reality that we live in. And then there's all these other images that come up that, that really, I think, throw questions in this idea of what it means to be free. And I think this is exactly what Paul was dealing with when he was writing the church at Rome, for example. I don't think that he was dealing specifically with certain sins. Paul changed his dialogue and his conversations with each new community that he addressed in the early church because each new community had their own dynamics, their own practices, their own rituals, and certainly their own beliefs and biases. And each one of them required someone to come in there and try to mediate the fact that this new kingdom requires something besides simply your way versus my way. And that was always the challenge. And we see it in our dynamics in a free country. I, this last week, I don't know if you saw or heard about the NPR, um, the, the uh, radio um, interview that came up about Samuel Wurlsbacher. Now, some of you all remember him as Joe the Plumber and how he had written a letter to one of the families whose child had died in the, uh, in the uh, gun shooting outside of the University of Southern California, where in, a sense he, in essence he wrote... I, I understand, I, I can't even begin to understand, but I sympathize and I am sorry for your loss of your child. And then he said this strong phrase, your dead child does not trump my right to, to um, uh, my rights, basically. But essentially what he was saying was my right to carry arms. What a strong statement. But it's not, un I mean, certainly that's not unusual. There are a number of people that would feel that way. And I could probably find any number of things that I might step on your toes with regard to. And you might be tempted to say, well, it's not your right to step on my rights. And that's essentially what Paul was dealing with. He was trying to suggest that, hey, we all screw up. And I often make mistakes. And don't we all? In fact, as I was thinking about that text, I, I had wanted to get with Terry beforehand because I actually thought the reading that text, I don't, uh, let me see if I could have that. The, I read it many times before deciding we'll go ahead and use it. I actually had a few folks that emailed me that had said, really, are we going to talk about sin this Sunday? I said, well, not really. It's okay. Come on in. Um, but no, I thought after reading it, I thought, you know, this would make a great stand-up routine. I am of the flesh, sold into slavery under sin. I do not understand my own actions. I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree that the law is good. But in fact, if it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells within me, for I know that nothing good dwells within me, my, that is in my flesh, I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. For if I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. Now, if I do, not, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I that do it. Right? I just envision people sitting around listening to this letter from Paul as someone's reading it, looking at each other like, really? He doesn't even know what he's talking about. He can't explain it. He's just making this stuff up. But in fact, no, Paul really was trying to address in as logical way as he could figure it and, as, and also within that dualistic thinking that has been a part of our culture in the Western world ever since Greek thinking, this idea that we are separate from our actions somehow. But it's important to understand, too, that what Paul's talking about here in the way of sin is not so much specific sins. Because in our understanding of the kingdom of God, what Paul was trying to communicate as well is this idea that sin is corporal. Sin is not individual. It's corporal. It's a destructive power of corruption that participates in more sinister and self-focused orientations in the world around us that ultimately threatens to dismantle community. Isn't that a fact? Isn't that what makes the whole social experiment of freedom so difficult? I do this little social experiment of my own. Um, don't throw it up yet, but get ready to, Michael. Um, I used to travel around. I meant to bring it. I have, a, I have a ukulele case that I carried around with me. I found this bumper sticker in Austin some years ago, and I would place the bumper sticker 
on the ukulele, and I would go through the airports. Go ahead and throw the image up. This is what it said. Never underestimate the power of stupid people in large groups. <laughs> now, I had a bumper sticker. It didn't have George, Car it didn't have George Carlin. I just had the bumper sticker that said that and had a crowd to one side shouting and screaming. And I would walk through the airport, my own little social psych experiment, and I would run it through the TSA security belt, I mean, uh, conveyor belt there. And sure enough, at the end, there was always somebody who would look at that and go, isn't that the truth? And I'd say, well, yes, ma'am, it is. And then I'd walk off and I'd go to my gate and then I would sit down. And in invariably, I might sit down to somebody wearing a really nice suit and a businessman. And he's sitting there and he's talking on the phone and he's talking loud enough, you know, that other people can hear the deal he's making. And, and then he leans over a little, you know, sort of secretively and looks, leans into me and says, isn't that the truth? <laughs> and I look at him and I go, well, yes, it is. And invariably, no matter where I would take this thing, I could show it to folks, and they would all say the same thing. Isn't that the truth? Didn't matter from which camp they were coming from or from what perspective or what ethnic group or what socioeconomic group, they all seemed to agree. Isn't that the truth? And then one day, I was up at a school performing at an at elementary school, and I keep it on the stage sometimes, and sure enough, a first grader came up to me after the performance and looked at that, and then he said... Who are the stupid people? <laughs> but we know, right? I mean, don't we know? We know who the stupid people are. Even in the church, you know, you can figure out who the stupid people are. Well, I won't go there. But I think, that, I think the challenge for us is this whole idea that it is easy for us in a free world with this idea of freedom that we, become to, we come to think that it's about my rights and maybe not my rights because I can, I can identify a whole group of people who think just like me. So it's really our rights. But it's so much more than that, which is what makes not just freedom, but this whole idea of God's presence in our world, so challenging, I think. Because we translate it right into our faith. We know who the stupid people are. I remember when I sat down, at, you know, nine weeks ago with the first group of folks in here that we were having our conversation and... and talking about what is the nature of 1111 and who are we, and then we all, almost in unison, everybody could say, well, we're not exactly sure who we are, but we know who we are not. And I would probably challenge you to say that you probably don't really know who you are not. We probably don't really know because the challenge of this whole idea of freedom is that it's so easy to fall into our individual thinking, the thinking that we brought with us from, from the social communities we grew up in, from the families we grew up in, from our own experiences. We bring that to the table, and it colors how we see everything. And without true conversation, without true dialogue, we really don't know. We just think we do. I want to show this video that I saw. Um, I know I have a couple of kids in here. <laughs> um, I, somebody passed this video on to me this last week. It's pretty troubling. Um, I didn't show the UK version of this video. I showed the um, US version of this video, which says, screw the poor. Uh, the UK version uses a much more colorful and um, uh, um, uh, perhaps a difficult word. Um, but I wanted to show you this, and plus the, uh, the crew back there in the back also knows where to bleep it, I hope, at the right moment. But this, to me, really was both troubling and enlightening. So uh, we're going to just look at it real quick. It's about 50 seconds. Screw the poor. 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 Scre
Through the board. The UK one is actually even more vocal, and we cut out a whole section, which if you want to, you can go check this out online, because it actually gets quite verbal. There's a group of folks that come up and just assault the guy verbally, but that was the part that we had to bleep out. Um, it was just an interesting social experiment, and of course they partnered up with the New York City uh, mission, homeless mission, but... But in, in the UK, they, home, they partnered up with a group called the Pylon Trust, which is a, a large organization that sponsors and helps nonprofits raise money for poverty, for hunger, for, for um, uh, homelessness, as well as for urban housing, a number of, a number of issues. Um, and, and then th this came up in, in mid-April, and so the New York City crew decided to try to do the whole thing uh, to, to replicate it here. I don't think that the folks in here are evil people. I think probably they could identify with Paul's words and say there are times when we do things we ought not to do and then don't do the things we ought to do and sometimes get it caught up in sort of a group think and just um, get comfortable in that sort of stat state. But I think it was more that these people are confused. I think it can be very confusing. And I think that it's not so much that they are selfish or that they don't care, but it's more that you get overwhelmed. What this thing shows is what's probably true for most of us in the same way as the song Rockin' the Free World. How much do we really think about what we value and what we hold dear and engage it in a way which is truly engaging with the community? Because our tendency is to slide back into our individual lives or to identify with the groups around us that think like us. <coughs> so we understand Paul. We can see how easy it is to fall into, those kinds of, into that kind of thinking. But I think for us, when we think about what it means to be a part of the kingdom, this is where I want to think in terms of what it means to be free. I think what God invites us into is not an individualist freedom. I don't think God invites us into a freedom that says we are called to, for example, find our fullest self. We are called to experience our best selves. I think our best selves, I think our most authentic selves, I think our fullest potential selves are discovered in relationship. I think that's when we begin to discover what's possible for us, not just as individuals, but as a community. This whole idea that freedom is really about a relational responsibility. The kingdom of God is really about connecting, engaging. And the challenge, of course, is to do so with a sense of balance with a sense of compassion. You know, when we did this drumming exercise, this rhythm exercise, I did it with this conference, and there's about 80 people at this conference, and they were dressed in, in various suits and stuff. Most of these were teachers and administrators. And, and like I told you, the, the uh, guy who was co-leading said, this is a disaster because we don't want these people to have a bad experience. And I said, well, I've done this a bunch, and it, and it worked. It worked much like it worked now. In reality, I think most of us feel naturally drawn to this idea that let's just find something we can all do together, and that will be the best you know, scenario, the best outcome. This idea that individually, if we, um, if we find a rhythm to tap into and we all tap into that, then that's, that's good. That's what community is about, all of us tapping into a singular rhythm. And it worked. We did that. 
When we tried to just do our own thing, of course, it was chaos, right? It was, it was chaos. It was irritating. It was, it was uncomfortable at points. But when we joined in with one unison voice, it became functional. I mean, it worked. Which was more interesting? I'm not, I'm not necessarily looking for an answer, but sort of just asking it myself. I'm, to me, if it is typical. I mean, to me, it, it was much more interesting to have the multi-layered rhythms. That may not be true for everyone, but I suspect it was true for most of us. I also suspect that you didn't react as much, although some of the band did back here, because probably like me and being musical, they're like, this is a recipe for disaster, to just say, go. <laughs> and see what happens. Um, but to me, this idea of creating something in community creates so many possibilities. But a couple of things have to happen. Number one, we have to be willing to bring what we have and who we are to community. But the second most important thing that is often lacking in our, in our culture is this idea that what you bring is just as significant. It may not be what I agree with. It may not be how I see the kingdom of God. But if I pay attention, I bet there's a pattern that we can come work out together that's more interesting than if we had just kept to ourselves or tried to find a common single beat. Carl Jung said something interesting a number of, way back in the early 60s when he was interviewing in his, in, with his book that came out then called Dreams and Memoirs. And what he had said was is that those things, essentially, I'm not going to quote him exactly, but what he had said was essentially was those things that trouble us in others are often a reflection of aspects of ourselves we have not come to terms with. Aspects of our shadow, essentially. The reality of his thinking and his understanding as he developed his own theories with this idea of the un unconscious, the, uh, the, um, the archetype and the total um, human unconscious that, that unites all of us is that, in fact, we share all of these shadows, these opinions, these experiences, these views, these human experiences and emotions. We share them all, but we just share them in different degrees because of how we're brought up or our backgrounds. But in reality, if we pay attention to one another, we find common links and often learn more about ourselves in the process. Rumi, I'm going to finish with this. Rumi had this wonderful little story that I, I used to perform musically. I'm just going to tell it to you quickly. Rumi, the, uh, the Sufi mystic that, that created the Sufist order of the Islamic faith, a more mystical sort of east-west tradition. Rumi had this story called the caged bird. A merchant has this bird, and he keeps it in a cage. Now, it's a beautiful bird. He spent a lot of time trying to get it. He put it in the cage, and he's kept it there. But every day, this bird would sing out a song of freedom. The merchant would oftentimes address the bird, would take care of the bird, but the bird always sang out a song of freedom. One day, when the merchant said he was going back to the place where he had picked up this bird, where he'd found it, back to the bird's own homeland, he said, since I'm going there, maybe I can take a message for you. And his bird began to jump excitedly. She said, of course you could take a message, but wouldn't it be better to take me with you? We will travel together. But he said, no, I'm not going to risk that. I mean, I, I, I spent so much effort to get to this place. I'm not going to risk losing this. You stay here. I'm going to tell a message if you want me to tell a message, but that's it. Just give me something to say and I'll pass it along. And the bird said, then at least tell them where I am. I know they must be worried. If you find another bird that looks like me, it's got to be a relative. Tell them that. And so he agreed to do that much, and he traveled to the other parts of the regions where he had found the bird originally, and he began to buy things and sell things and trade. And in all of his traveling around, never found any birds that looked like his own. He was about to give up. 
On his way home, passing back out through the forest, he heard a song that sounded like his own bird's song, looked up, saw the same colored feathers, the same kind of bird, called out to it, a relative of yours is in a cage in my home. She's fine, but she wanted you to know that so you wouldn't worry. And perhaps not realizing the power of his own words, he looked up as the bird suddenly stiffened up and fell from the branch, hit the ground. He quickly ran over and he tried to move the bird. The bird was lifeless, didn't make a sound. He thought the poor bird died of a broken heart. He tried to do the right thing, he thought. So he went home. When he got back to his own home, his own bird was still singing excitedly when he stopped and said, I gave the message that you gave to me. But I'm sorry to say, as soon as those words were out of my mouth, your bird, your relative, fell from a tree and must have died from a broken heart. And he stepped back. He said, I'm sorry. I wish I could give you better news. But as soon as his own words were out of his mouth, again, not recognizing the power of one's words and actions, he saw his own bird suddenly fall lifeless to the bottom of the cage. Didn't move a feather or make a sound. And when he opened up the cage to look at the bird and held it up in his hand, the bird leapt up and flew out the window. When she got to a safe distance, she said back, you did not bring me bad news, not sad news. Your words and your actions were glad news because they showed me how to find my freedom. A little poem story from Rumi. What if, in fact... The kingdom of God requires nothing more of us than that we willingly engage with one another to learn more, not about themselves so much. What if we engage with one another to learn more about ourselves? How much more open might our community be? Amen. I'm going to ask everyone to stand together. Holly Near was in Dallas not too long ago. And uh, this is a song that we've done with Holly Near before. It's uh, I Am Willing. It's a wonderful song to close this off. I want to just let everyone know that, um, first of all, we have someone in the back. That We always have folks in the back. If you have a special prayer request, there will be a couple of us back there. And we would love, love for you to come back in the back and we'll pray with you. If you'd like to join the church... And through this uh, community, 11-11 Celebration, we always invite folks to come up while we're singing to do that. Um, and then the other thing is, is that I will be out for the next Sunday. Linda McDermott will be in preaching, so I know a lot of you will want to be here for that. And uh, I'll be working with a bunch of 11th and 12th graders at Southwestern University and living in a dorm room. And some of you know that I'm slightly claustrophobic. So be thinking positive thoughts. <laughs> Let's uh, sing together.